Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. I got to tell you something, people. Back in uh, the spring of 1982, it was my freshman year at Stockton State College down there in Pomona, New Jersey, and I lived in H dorm, and I was on the first floor, and I had two friends I made up, up on the third floor named Frank Toriello and Stuart Rosenthal. Well, Stuart's roommate name was Eli, and he was listening to Dead Kennedys, and he would always listen to the album Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables. And I had not heard the Dead Kennedys, being from Philadelphia. It was the, I just didn't, we didn't have any punk stations, and I really uh, dug their music. And it's just amazing that I'm talking to the bassist, an album that came out in 1980. They remixed it, and it's uh, it's 42 years old. And my guest from Dead Kennedys is Klaus Floride. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. How you doing? No complaints. So. Looking back, can you believe that that album is 42 years old? Uh, yes, I can, because I've been <laughs> living through all the time since then. But yeah, it's uh, if you'd asked me when we recorded it, that we, if we'd be talking about it 42 years, you, 42 years later, I'd go, yeah, right, sure, sure we will. <laughs> so why... All of a sudden, when, why did you decide to make the the uh, remix? You're fully remixing it. It's coming out September 30th. What um, what prompted you guys to do that? Uh, we'd always, not always, not when we recorded it, but after after that and after it came out, we noticed basically in comparison with other records and things uh, that. It was a great record, we thought, but the fidelity wasn't what we had in mind. Uh, we'd been in studios very rarely before, uh, and uh, we kind of thought, well, the idea at the 40th anniversary, which was a couple of years ago, and then COVID happened, that we do a 20, 20 year re-release. 40-year re-release, I mean, and uh, re-mix it to where it sounds uh, better, just fatter, rounder. And so that's what sort of inspired it. How's that for a ramble on? That's good. I always ramble. My wife says I ramble too much. I, you can ramble all you want. I'll be happy. It'll make me, it'll make me sound good. Um, okay. I want to I want to talk about it, the Dead Kennedy is in, but I want to talk about how you got into music. And I, I don't, you know, you never know if Wikipedia is true, but it said when you were a little kid, you had a fascination with records. Is is that true? Yeah, it is. It's tough Everything about it. from, well, I mean, my folks had a big old, what was called a Zenith record player, is a big console record player from the forties. Uh, <clears throat> when I was growing up. This almost godlike piece of equipment fascinated me, and myself. They got me a little uh, a record player that looked like a snare drum when I was a little kid, and uh, it had no amplifier in it. It just had a motor and a turntable, and the arm was uh, the old Victrola type arm, so it was an acoustic thing. But and uh, yeah, I just I. I not only grew up loving music, but I was fascinated with that on this piece of plastic, uh, a needle would go through it and then something would, all this music would come emanating from it. When you look back on it, it, it is pretty fascinating because, you know, I'm the same way. You know, I remember the one you had the 45 and it had that the little uh, thing you'd snap in so it can go on to the turntable and yeah. it was just, it, it was amazing that when you look at a piece of, you know, plastic, that it, music came out of it. And now, did that, did that fascination, is that what made you want to become a musician? Well, the fascination with the, fascination with the music and plus, okay, for one thing, I'm talking 78 when I was a kid. Uh, the, they had 45s, but I mean, our house just had 78s until maybe 56 or something like that. Um, the music itself, and especially seeing people on TV, uh, Buddy Holly, stuff like that, Buddy Holly on the on the Ed Sullivan show is what really made me say, give me a guitar. 
because here's this skinny guy with glasses making music and i i could relate because i had skinny kid with glasses <laughs> and i liked the music anyhow my i have an older brother and sister and they had been feeding me things like little richard and jerry lee lewis records and so i was primed to go by the time i was seven or eight so when did you actually start playing though i mean because i can't see a seven-year-old playing i mean that must be when be i great. was I, when i was eight i got a first first guitar i didn't play in front of people till i was around 14 13 or 14 literally playing on the front porch for somebody who came to the door that was a, a girl i had a crush on i played some song for her my brother goes that was cool <laughs> and uh and then like uh having a, a early surf band that played on the shores of lake huron <laughs> in michigan uh that was when i was like 14 or 15 and then bands school bands after that like i high school and junior high school uh instrumental bands and sort of beetle copy bands and things so when do you start pursuing it out of high school what's what's your what is your goals when you graduate high school were you in your mind saying i'm going to be a musician or did you have another goal or what were you thinking when you graduated high school well i knew i'd be playing music i never i never had the goal of making a living from it because i just thought that was absurd when i was a kid doing homework i picture yeah, when I'm all 21 and 22, that, that old, oh God, uh, you know, I'll be hopefully a scientist or something. Uh, that's what I was kind of shooting for, although I was doing horrible in school. Uh, and then uh, I kept, I mean, I played in bands from, from the time I was 15 on, and they were all sorts of varied things, and some was folk and some was uh you know uh blues and r&b type stuff and i wasn't playing bass until uh until i was 19 i think it was 18 or 19 i got my first bass what made you want to yeah. what, what made you decide to play bass uh there was i had two other friends and we were going to start a band and one played guitar and one played drums and so i was decided to be the bass player and uh and i went to i was living in boston at the time i went to a place called jack's drums which was a music store there uh, and uh i had twenty dollars and i said what do you got for twenty dollars and the guy says serious are you serious and i said yeah and he, so he took me down into the basement of the place and leaning against this big huge oil heater building heater was an old dan electro which is this beautiful bass now nowadays it's like sought after but uh this had a uh no bridge saddle and stuff like that so it was uh, he said you can have this if you don't tell anybody where you got it <laughs> so i'm breaking my promise to him now but uh and i used for the bridge at first i used a good humor stick and then eventually it became a toothbrush and that took really well <laughs> so it's a single pickup dan electro bass and uh that was that's you know it's i wish i still had it <laughs> <laughs> was it was it easy to transition because you would play guitar to bass is that an easy transition because i'm not musical or is it would it be harder to going from bass which is easier going from bass to guitar or guitar to bass I wouldn't know about going from bass to guitar, but I can speak from going guitar to bass. I basically, no pun intended, I, I uh, play lead guitar type bass lines a lot of the time. I play lead bass is what I like to think sometimes. Uh, it's not just holding down the bottom. It's, in the Kennedys, it sort of formed a... a I race as I played the rhythm bass, you know, the rhythm guitar part on bass. Especially since the Kennedy started out, we had a second guitarist, uh, 6025. And when he was gone, my stuff had to fill in a lot more. And uh, that's that's just was always my style was informed by guitar. Now, the Kennedys, 
How did you, well, you ended up in San Francisco. How, why did you go to San Francisco? Was there a certain reason you just wanted to change your pace? You were in Boston, I believe you were in New York, or and then you went yeah. to San I, I was living in Boston, New York, back and forth, and uh, mostly mostly Boston and playing in R&B bands and stuff, and I just kind of got tired of doing the bar scene and, and the blues scene and uh, white guys playing blues, and I can drink you under the table, and I'm sure you can, and that whole thing like that. So I, I moved out to San Francisco because... Um, it seemed like the thing to do, basically. It was a break from what I'd been sort of stuck into, the rut I was stuck into. But I didn't come out here with the intention of being in a punk band or anything like that. I just barely knew about punk when I came out here. and But I was interested in it. I'd seen a couple of things on the Sex Pistols on TV, and, and then that made me go to record stores and seek it out. And... Uh, I liked what it was doing. And so uh, eventually, after about a year in San Francisco, I um, put an ad. I didn't put an ad. I, I read an ad that East Bay Ray had put in a paper called uh, Bay Area Musician, BAM Magazine, which was not a punk outlet at all, but who knew, you know? So I answered that ad, and uh, Ray and I got together and played a couple of Peggy Sue in his garage amongst other things. And, uh, and he says, well, I have this guy that seems to be pretty good. So then we got together and, uh, with Biafra and, uh, we decided, yeah, this is a good thing. So, so how did you, worked. how did you go into the direction of punk? I mean, if you're playing Peggy Sue, I mean, the ad, what, what did the ad say? Did the ad say, I'm just, I want to start a band or did it say, well, uh, it said starting a punk band. Uh, and, uh, when I, when I responded, I, you know, he asked, what are you interested in? I said, well, everything from Ramones to Devo to, uh, but even though they were punk things like craft work and things, uh, Peggy Sue, if you think about it, is is kind of like what the Ramones were doing. I mean, they were doing very basic, you know, da 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 da, da type things, and it was a three chord song that was very punkish, mm -hmm. without trying to cover a punk song. And Ray and I had both been playing for a while, so we both knew that one. So that's why that's why we used that. But yeah, no, we were all looking to get a punk thing going. So what is what was that scene like? I mean, there wasn't a big scene like getting gigs. I mean, how how did that all start? Because you know, you think about it. I talked to you know Richard Lloyd from television. He said there wasn't really a scene in New York. There was some, and, and in San Francisco, you know, punk wasn't real big yet. But how do you guys go about? I mean, it's 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 pretty smart on your how you guys built your career up. But I mean, how did you get around in the beginning? How did you start getting gigs? I mean, did people? Did you say we're a punk band? I mean, how did that happen? Well, in the beginning, in San Francisco at least, uh, there was a club called the Mabuhay Garden, which had been booking groups. We weren't, we weren't the first punk band in San Francisco by a long shot. There was the Mutants, the Avengers, the Dills, uh, all, all these groups that uh, I'm leaving about 10 out. We played our first gig on a bill with, I think, six bands and and they were all punk bands it was a punk night at the Mabue Gardens and most nights at the Mabue Gardens it became punk nights uh, so there was that we had a place to uh, approach and uh, and uh, then there was other pop-up venues that were starting to happen in San Francisco and uh, eventually you know, when we started the band we thought Maybe we'll last two years, and with luck, we'll get to go to L.A., you know. <laughs> that was our sort of our goal, last two years if we can, and maybe get to L.A. So what's your progression in San Francisco? How do you, how do you get that first album made? I mean, are you, do you get a following at clubs, or how does that first album come about? Well, we recorded one time before that first album, uh, at a place called Different Fur, which is real high-endy studio. But uh, there's a guy, 
uh, Bruce Connor, who was an artist who was interested in the scene and interested in anything uh, strange. And he was a he was a really cool artist. And he decided to bring us and he'd seen us, I guess, at the McGroy and decided to bring us into a studio to record. And that was our first time in a studio. And it was like, oh, my goodness, this isn't this isn't sounding well and blah, blah, blah. The tapes still exist someplace, but uh, we can't get access to them. Um, and then after that, we decided, yeah, well, let's first we put a single out, a California Uberalis single, and that that caught on in England. And uh, and then Cherry Red from England decided to bring us out, but they said, or some people decided to bring us out, but they said, we can't bring you out on the strength of a single, so let's throw some money at you and you record an album. And the money that they gave us was like $10,000, $8,000, something like that to record a whole album. And I think we used everything, but we used maybe 6,000 and then split up the rest of the money between us. Cause that's, we thought that was all we were going to see. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh and like I say, that's that was part of why the record didn't sound like we like it sounded in our heads, like it sounded at practices, like it sounded at gigs. Uh, it was immediate, but it wasn't. Uh, I mean, we were listening to the Sex Pistols album, thinking, "Oh my God, that they, they just went into the studio and they sounded like that." We didn't know that the guitar was overdubbed right. like eight eight times and. Uh, <laughs> And it was Chris Spedding or something like that. I don't know. It's probably not Chris Spedding, but that was the rumor that went on afterwards that uh, no, Steve Jones is going to kill me for that. But uh, <laughs> uh, but anyhow, we didn't know that, you know, they had a big time producer and all that. We sort of knew, but we didn't know what difference that would make. And uh, so the record came out and it did well and it sounded, but it sounded kind of boxy and uh, it didn't sound like other records both by intention as far as the music and not by intention as far as the fidelity. Now the record starts doing well and you know, what's, what's happens to you guys and are you starting to get bigger gigs? Are you starting to travel more? Is it getting you notoriety because people are like, they have this album. It's a good album. How does that start shaping your career? Well, we were bigger in Europe than we were here at first especially in the UK and Germany. And uh, so our first, I mean, we had done a tour of the East Coast uh, when we just had the single out, but it was badly timed and the single wasn't a lot of stores. And it was like, we came back from that. We were about ready to throw the towel in. And then uh, we decided to carry out. Biafra ran for mayor. That helped a bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, then, uh, then we, so we went to Europe and we got a bit of, and then when we came back from Europe, then it was back from the European tour. And then that was a whole generation of, uh, of uh, uh, publicity that we didn't even think about ahead of time that much. And so then we got to go up and down the West Coast and then started to do uh, touring. But there was no touring sick circuit as such for punk bands. So what did you have to blaze that pattern? I mean, I, I did stand up comedy for in the late eighties, early nineties for a while. And a comics now I know that are older used to go and there was like no comedy clubs. And they would go and they would get there'd be like one comedy club and they'd go and then they someone would call a club and go, Oh, well, you know, we just opened a, a club in Houston, so they drive to Houston. Then oh, oh, Wichita. And it just is that what happened with you guys? It just start clubs just started opening as punks started getting bigger, or did it did you have to really do those long the, rides, the gigs, or what was that like? There were long drives, uh, and there were mostly uh, halls that kids rented. And a lot of those shows, the police tried to shut down the shows because they didn't like gatherings of punks and stuff. Uh, but they just didn't understand it. They thought it was, oh, dangerous and everything. Uh and it was to them in a certain way, but it wasn't the kind of dangerous they thought it was, you know, where it wasn't a big drug scene or anything. But there, it started out being 
uh, um, not very many clubs. It started out being rented halls and throw together PA systems and, uh, and uh, like that. And eventually clubs started happening that were allowing punk, but there weren't very many clubs that were featuring punk and there still aren't very many clubs or, well, you know, uh, that there are clubs that feature alternative music now, let's say, and there weren't many of that back then. So now, what was what were the young what was the young punk crowd like when you guys started when you were playing gigs? What would you classify the punks? I know later you guys had said they came to you know violent skinheads stuff like that, but what was what was the young punk when you started out? Like, what was your crowd like? Well, in San Francisco, especially when we were first playing the the punk quote unquote punk scene was so varied a show would have a uh, an art rock band a, a new wave band and by art rock i don't mean emerson lake and palmer type art rock i mean like there was a band called the situations there was a band called pink section there were just doing angular music let's say and then there was a rockabilly sort of thing that was a uh, rockabilly fringe of punk which ended up becoming punkabilly and stuff but uh there was so a show would have like almost four different versions of of what you want to call punk there and it was a variety from band to band then eventually it sort of started to become you know especially once hardcore kicked in it was uh an awful lot of uh just you know, and then that's fine, but five bands like that in a row makes me crazy. Uh, so we've always had to try. We've tried to have uh, some variety in the in the opening bands, and when we're on tour, we try to have uh, uh, some local bands on the bill. You know, not tour with uh, just another big band. Uh, as far as the kids, uh, in the early days, it was a mixture of kids just curious and, you know, looking like a normal 70s or eight, early 80s kid. And then there was, uh, then there was, you know, the kids that were buying the pre, pre-set uniform of, uh, of what a punk should have, black leather jacket, torn t-shirt, you know, safety pins and stuff. But, you know, it, it was all welcome, you know, because everybody was there to have uh, a good time, basically. Now, what was the writing process for you guys back then? I mean, did you have a certain, you know, did Jello do the did the uh, lyrics and you guys would do the music? Or how was it? Or was it all just a, a process where you all just pitched in? Um, our very first song, Holiday in Cambodia, was... And I think it was our first song we wrote together. It was uh, done in Ray's living room on his maybe the first or second time we got together at Biafra. Um, we came up with the Biafra had lyrics, and Ray and I came up with music riffs and like that. Uh, a lot of the time, Biafra would have a lyric, uh, and he'd come over to my place and he'd say, "Here's the lyric," and here's a sketch of what he wanted to, it to sound like. And then I'd throw some riffs at him and he'd say, oh, that, that one's good or that one's, you know. And and so we'd take something like that and then we present it to Ray. We learned early on not to try to do this thing all together as a band because there'd just be not enough focus and too much fiddling around. And uh, be... I'd bring in a riff, Ray would bring in a riff, Biafra would throw lyrics to it, or Biafra would bring in some lyrics and an idea for a riff, and Ray and I would put something together uh, that sounded like an actual song. <laughs> now, now, were your all your political views the same? Like, with, with, uh, with Biafra's uh, lyrics, was, were you guys all had the same mindset, or was it something that you knew that he was very head fast on the lyrics and, and you guys were just happy because you got to create the music, which to me, when I listen to his song, I'm always, I always, 
I'm fascinated by lyrics, but I'm always fascinated when you hear a song and you just hear something and you go, holy shit, how, how did they think to put that in, in that song? I mean, what was, were you guys on the same page as him with his views or, or was it just something that you were a band? We, we love the humor and the, the weirdness and we tried to keep the music um, humorous without being shtick, you know. Uh, we like to make it sound happily bizarre. Uh, you know, we, we like the residents, for instance. We all like the residents and that duck stab sort of thing. Uh, we all had influences that we came in, me with rock and roll and jazz from my parents' records and uh, Ray brought in jazz also. He did not into the thing, but he was influenced by that and the musical changes that happened and, and that sort of thing. Plus, he brought in, Ray and I both had surf bands and we brought in that sort of thing. And then we liked, Ray liked spaghetti westerns specifically. So he brought a little bit of that in. And Biafra, you know, was into things like Hawkwind, which was, you know, pre-motorhead weirdness. And uh, and uh, his, his collection of records is pointedly bizarre. Uh, that That's what fascinated him the most, was the bizarre. And people say, oh, you guys have a good sense of humor. No, it's a good sense of bizarre is what, is what we have and uh, have. And... Uh, so that's uh, the, that influenced how you know his lyrics influenced where we were going musically, and our music influenced what the next group of things he would write maybe. So you're playing. You have these, and at one point during your career with the with the Kennedys, you decided to do a solo album. So now I want to hear about that because that was like after your first the Dead Kennedy's first album or the second album. When did you decide to do the solo album? Oh yeah, I did a single, uh, the Short and Bread thing, uh, because basically I had a four track machine, a four track TIAC, and I could, I was experimenting with the, it and a little drum machine, and uh, Doctor Rhythm I think it was called, uh, and I did a version of just a little funk riff and. Uh, my girlfriend at the time said, well, it kind of sounds like shortening bread. And so I put shortening bread on top of it. And that was the A side of the first single. And there was a, a moody instrumental on the other side called uh, Drowning Cowboy. And, you know, that sold all of 50 copies. So I thought, <laughs> well, let's keep going. And the next thing I did, though, was... Uh, an EP called Cha 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 with Mr. Fluoride, influenced by the Cha Cha Records covers more than anything that I had a collection of Cha Cha Records just for the covers. And then uh, and then there was Because I Say So, which is really the first full album that I did. And again, they were all informed by, I mean, they sound like, all those records sound like uh, a mixtape more than a specific uh, artist doing something. I try and make it like you could put it on scramble and uh, you know, on, 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 you know, whatever it's called, not scramble. Uh, you know, just, you could play it in any order you wanted to and it would work just as well. Uh, so there was that. And then there was finally uh, the last thing I put out uh, officially was uh, the light is flickering. Um, and soon I'll have another one out really soon. I promise in the next 20 years. Yeah. No, no. Uh, with the Kennedys after, uh, Fresh Fruit came out, how, how was it for you to record your second album? Was it easier? Did the studios know you, you had some popularity or, or how did that work when you came out with your second album? Well, we did the album. The second one was really an EP, a mini LP. And we did it at a place called Target Video, which was a, a cooperative of people who uh, recorded all the punk shows, or a lot of the punk shows. I can't record them all, but and they have a Joe Reese was the main guy for that, and he had a a, a great sense of let's document all of this stuff. And in the back of their warehouse was a little uh, recording studio, 
uh, Mike Fox was the guy who ran the studio in the back, and we decided to go in and record some songs there and uh, some of the stuff we had that we hadn't recorded yet. And, uh, and Target would come in and uh, Target Video would come in and uh, record, you know, video the thing. And that became In God We Trust Incorporated first. Uh, but the tape was weird tape stock and it all started to disintegrate. And so we, <laughs> so we just held on to the tape and went and re-recorded it over at Hyde Street Studios in San Francisco. Well, I mean, we're in San Francisco with Target Video also, but um, I digress. So we, we did it that way. And then eventually, just recently in the past decade or so, we released the In God We Trust because we figured out how to save that original tape. And, uh, and so we released that as a video along with the remix album. Uh, so the video finally came out of us making that first that second album the first ep and sort of our first hardcore album as such uh, sort of uh, early 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 hardcore stuff and we dad we dabbled in that and then moved on <laughs> now were you, at this time were you still touring were you out in the road or what was what was your life like when you were recording were you still i mean was punk was oh, yeah. growing were you say so you were touring a lot were you touring the world or what was what was that like yeah, we were we were th by that point going to Europe and touring the United States, and Canada, uh, a lot. We were almost always either on the road or in the studio or doing gigs locally. Now, what was it like for the band? Because I know sometimes people consider the lyrics controversial. You know, some and, and it's funny; it still, still goes on today that people will sit there and they'll hear a title and they they get all pissed off. My thing is, well, you just don't listen to it, you know. But what was it like for you guys? Because you dealt with that back then, and and it was, you know, you know, parts of America and they still are could be very very stuffy. I mean, what was it like for you guys? Did you ever go into a town where people were just like? parents were pissed off or people were just pissed off that you came in oh yeah so what how uh, did you guys we, that? Tell we, me some stories. we 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 liked to shake people up and we didn't like to do shock for shock's sake we you know we could have called the band something that uh wasn't dead kennedy's we we could have used something that was just plain you know stupidly annoying but uh we tried to keep um, some intelligence into the way we slap people around, slap the uh, complacency around. And uh, so, yeah, when people were annoyed, we knew we were doing something right. And we kept doing it. And certainly we'd intensify it a bit if we could. Give me some examples of some people that you annoyed. Because I, I, that just, give me, I mean, if you remember some things that you just went, holy crap, we're in the wrong place, but this is great. Well, well Biafra annoyed the daylights out of Diane Feinstein for one thing way back when he ran for mayor came in fourth when she was running for mayor he came in fourth in the field of 10 people running for mayor and caused a runoff and she's going to if something like Jello Biafra can come in and cause a runoff something's wrong with America and he's precisely was the idea uh, uh, going and doing songs like I killed children really annoyed Tipper Gore because she took it literally <laughs> and uh, and that it was something promoting killing children as, as opposed to what it was, which was really uh, looking through the eyes and getting into the mind of somebody that would do that and why they would do that. And like the bridge of that song explains the thought process of a person that would kill children and what drove them to be that crazy. And so all this stuff the people that would get annoyed were the people that wouldn't look into what was behind the f the front of the what was behind the thing that made us slap them basically well that always happens you know people people will sit there and come to a, a uh, conclusion before they actually do any investigation and especially now on on the internet you know people will just sit there and go off before they even really see and go oh wow 
they meant this. They'll just hear something and they'll just go crazy. And you guys were prompting that before, you know, it was happening. Yeah, the Internet, unfortunately, especially social media, has really made it easy and popular to be stupid. <laughs> And, uh, and, and gang group mentality that, that, that is negative, gets encouraged, blah, blah, blah. And none of it does delve be, be much below the surface of anything. Uh, you have to really search to find something that's not uh, just headlines and, and uh, you know, that's why things like Trump were possible, basically. Somebody like Trump never could have gotten the traction. Oh, yeah. I, the it, internet. Oh, yeah. It's, internet. it's crazy. So now you guys are, your career's going, you're doing well. So what causes, why do you guys decide to split? Was it creative? Was it, you know, was you had four albums? Which is amazing to think that you guys have put such an imprint on punk and music and you only have four albums, which is something that says volumes about the music you were creating. But what happened? Why did you guys end up splitting that first time? Uh, it was just the there were, there were personal personality conflicts going on. There was uh, uh, different goals. You know, we we've been together for shoes something like eight years at the time we split, and uh, we were just going in different uh, directions and wanting to do different things. And the offer was. Uh, starting to do stuff that Ray and I couldn't necessarily get behind uh, and DH and uh, and at the same time you know we'd done the run sort of you know the first time we uh, sort of thought let's take a break and do something else basically and we did and then we got to back together without Biafra in the, the early 2000s how did that come about? What did you guys just sit well, there and go? We miss each other, or how? Uh, we had had a lawsuit that was—I don't even want to go into—but it was a miserable experience all around for everybody. And uh, and Ray and DH and I decided, let's play some music. That's what got us together in the first place. Let's do do this again. And the songs were were still resonating resonating in lots of ways and so but we thought we were just going to do a one-off uh at a record signing in la because uh mutiny by the bay had just come out and uh and the word got out that we were going to do this one-off and there was a big line and people were there and we had a different singer brandon cruz could do the singing and uh and and then agents approached us and said, you know, we could do this and make a tour out of it. And we said, oh, don't be foolish. But then, but then we ended up doing just that. And we've been doing that now for, you know, 20 years. Now, did you, did you, you took a break for a year, right? I took, we took a break for a year. You, I took a break. Did you take a break for a year during, during a tour? I had some, I had some uh, medical issues that made me, have to drop out for a while. Uh, I think there was one tour without me. Now, does it, do you miss that? Like, do you just sit there when you, I mean, I know it's medical, so I've had medical issues, so you have to take care of yourself. But do you sit there and would you, would you think, oh, wow, man, someone's playing my parts. I mean, does that go through your mind as an artist and someone who, you, you know, you're a founding member of the band. You've been in it the whole time. Yeah. Would, would you think uh, that? Yeah, it did. Of course it did. I'm sure it goes on with Biafra a lot of the time, too. Um, but... Basically, I figured out how to manage the issue and got back in by the next tour. Uh, yeah, it drives you crazy, but you also can't say to the other guys, I'm not playing, so you can't tour. You know, you can't say that. And uh, just making sure, basically, that the audience knows uh, that there's a replacement person in there. We've We've gone out without DH a couple of times because he's got medical issues on and off. So, uh, so yeah, and now we're old guys <laughs> and we're still doing it. No, no, what, it, how, how has you, we, go ahead. 
we we make sure i mean our tours are more than a couple of weeks three weeks at a time because uh we know at which point we don't want to do a show that we wouldn't want to go to and so we know our limits basically and so uh but we still put everything into shows when we do them now how, how has the crowd changed i mean i'm sure there's People who like my age, when I said, you know, I heard you in college, they show up and then they have kids. And then there's probably, you know, young punks you know, into punk music. I mean, when you when you're on stage and you look into the crowd, who who's there now? I mean, is it is it all different ages? Yeah, that's that's a great thing. We didn't know what we were going to be getting into at first, but there's people who never saw us back in the day. Uh, at first, there were people who never saw us back in the day. Um and certainly there is mostly that now. Um, and everything from kids in their teens, if it's an all ages show, uh, uh, into their sometimes 80s. Uh, people who were older people that were interested in punk when it started coming out, uh, turn up. And because, uh, I mean, back, back in the day, there was this woman that turned up at shows called Lenora Real Cool Chick was her, her punk name. But she was like, she was like, you know, a proper old with a hat and the, you know, lady who would turn up at shows and, oh, I just love these punk rock kids. And uh, she was cool. That was what her, she was dubbed as Lenora Real Cool Chick. And, uh, you know, so people that age were coming to our shows back then and coming to punk shows. Uh, so people who are still alive still come to the shows that even if they're just barely and all the way down to teenagers. So it's great. Um, uh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and it's not like we're not totally aware of that the entire time. Uh, I remember when we first started getting to be a deal and uh, back in, back in the eighties and and sort of going on automatic pilot once in a while just to look at the mayhem that was going on and sort of scan it and try and make a video in my brain of what was going on and to remember because I was constantly aware and I still am that there's millions of kids that want to be rock stars or whatever. Want to, people just wanting to get on stage and perform and cause that sort of reaction. And I got to do it, and I still get to do it. And it's uh, it's a ridiculous thing that uh, I'm constantly aware of and totally feel great about and happy. And, and uh, But uh, people are going lately, when we started, Klaus, you have a big grin on your face all the time. It's not very punk. I say, I just can't help it. This is so fun. <laughs> you know, and, uh, but, yeah, so... It's uh, it's 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 something that that I still can't get used to. I don't think I'll ever get used to it. Now, did it bother you during the pandemic when you guys couldn't go on the road? Did you miss it? I mean, even though you're doing yeah, the sure. I mean, yeah. so w what did you do? I always think you know, you musicians are used to touring and stuff like that. What do you do when you're a musician and you can't tour? Are you out in the garden and people are like, holy shit, there's a dead Kennedy out in the garden? He's uh, you know, what were you? <laughs> That was the thing is you couldn't go like vacation, like a regular vacation. You were sort of, you know, you were sort of stuck where you were and you couldn't go out to restaurants. You got, I just did what everybody did. I, you know, basically got along day by day and, and kept thinking it's going to be over soon. And it's still not over. But uh, uh, it is, you know, I mean... There's that expression, it is what it is, which to me just means you're fucked and there's nothing you can do about it. Don't mean to swear in the show, but there you go. That's right. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, but that's sort of what it was for everybody. So, you know, you can't, I can't complain about that. Complain about COVID, you know, just complain that it got to where it got through partially, I mean, I blame Donald Trump in lots of ways for not clamping down on it. I think he's a good deal of responsibility for a good deal of irresponsibility. 
it was it was crazy times. I mean, I actually I was I'm vaccinated and boosted, and I actually ended up getting it finally. And I and I was sitting there thinking I got it a few weeks ago, and me and my wife were and I gave it to her. We were about the few weeks later we we're going to New Orleans for a wedding anniversary, and I'm like, okay, well at least we got it now, you know. But it was funny, and I think that you know if I wasn't, you know, everything, I, I would have really been hurting. I was hurting anyway. A lot of people told me, oh, it's just like a cold. I said, no, no, I, I sat there. <laughs> <laughs> it sucked, but you know it was crazy. But I think a lot of people have you have you had it? Yes, recently, and uh, it was I didn't get I, because I've been vaxxed, uh, you know, what, maybe three, four times now. Uh, I just got the booster, uh, but uh, you know, it, it was not the sickest I've been ever by a long shot. Uh, it was. I'm, you know, I could do stuff briefly and then go, what was I thinking? You know, and sit down and go, oh, okay, time to rest. But uh, that lasted, uh, I think it was in and out within a week. Now, you guys have a European tour coming up, right? Yep. Now, now, yep. now, which is good that you got it before then, because that's like, you know, you think it would suck if you were over there and you got it and you'd be like, oh, shit. I mean, you have to be very careful. How is your popularity still huge in Europe? I and mean, I know you're going to Spain and France. I mean, what's your no, popularity came, over there? We just came back from a European tour and we're going out for like part two. The first one was mostly clubs. And this is going to be, I think, primarily uh, festivals. Um, yeah, we're still popular. We still, the clubs were all, well, the COVID is still affecting clubs, uh, and, and shows in general, uh, uh, people buy tickets and then don't come sometimes, uh, a lot, you know, percentage of people have to get refunds or whatever. Uh, but no, it's still, it's, we wouldn't be able to afford to go over there if it wasn't still really popular for us to go over there. Now, do you guys, do you ever talk to Biafra anymore or do you guys just don't communicate? Uh, we basically don't communicate. We talk through lawyers and stuff and it's awful and it's sad and, but I, you know, I don't hate the guy. It's, you know, I think he's really still i think he's still being creative i think there's all sorts of stuff uh that's good about him but we just don't share it much anymore now looking back the album came out the, the remix is coming out what what's your take on it do you really like it do you sit there and do you hear the difference because you know um, there's people who never had the album and they'll go oh well i'm gonna get it now and then there's people who had the album who go well, I'm definitely going to get it now because it's remixed. What's what's your take on it? When you listened to it, did it did it make you happy? Or did it, was it a good job? Well, yeah, the process was really long because COVID. Like I say, we started the idea right before COVID, and then COVID happened, and we come with Chris Lord Algae and and say, yeah, this is perfect. No, it needs a little more of this. We had to send sound files back and forth and back and forth, tweaking it a bit at a time, and him getting the idea exactly what we were looking for he came in with a pretty good idea of what he wanted to do with it and uh, uh what it sounds one of the things that it's got is the mid-range was the highest thing uh which is kind of like the the telephone frequencies are the highest accent in the original mix and the guitar and the snare drum and and Biafra's vocal were all sort of the same range. And, and so they all fought with each other also. So one of the things we did was we accented different parts of Biafra's vocal and it's, and, and still keeping it predominantly in front and different parts of the guitar range and different parts of the band in general to make it so it breathes a little more. There's a little more air in there. It's not so claustrophobic no pun intended with my name but uh uh it's uh, so it breathes a little more and it and it and because of that uh, it wears it's easier to listen to uh as far as as far as not getting fatigued from the one mid-range punching you the entire time 
Now, now, when you guys play live, what is what is your favorite song personally to play live? Did you have one that you said you just you love the bass part, or is there all of them? It changes almost day to day. On a gig, I will go into it thinking, oh, okay, by the end of the show, I'm thinking, well, wow, that was really cool. I figured out something I want to do on this song because we changed what we play just ever so slightly. We still want, we still want to stay faithful to. The songs, but at the same time, we want to. We're musicians, and we want to change something a little bit each time. And so, um, so, but all the time, the main thing is serving the song. You know, having the song, the music itself is is uh, the tunes are what rule that stuff. But eh, I that people have asked me that before. I can never give a right answer, but I mean a correct answer or an honest answer about what's my favorite song because they the set that we play for the most part they're all our favorites and that's why we choose them one final question and and you've probably been asked this millions of times but where did your name come from okay uh the the name again like i was saying we we don't like to do shock for shock's sake Uh, but the name dead kennedy's for one thing was i think introduced to us to us by um a friend of biafra's because he knew of some band in ohio that was using the name and wouldn't play out of the garage they wouldn't go and try and get gigs and they were i don't know what kind of music they were at all but we literally asked them through somebody else if they mind and they said yo good good luck with that and so we used it but to us it represented um it wasn't a slam on the Kennedys as much as a slam on what caused them to be killed in a way. Uh, the the craziness in America, the death of the American dream at that point when first John Kennedy was shot down and then Robert Kennedy was shot down. And at the time we came up with that, that was the main two dead Kennedys. Uh, but uh, it, so it, re- it was not shock for shock's sake it had a to us it had a meaning behind the name how about klaus fluoride uh okay well when we were first playing before we did any well i guess we even did some gigs with different names i mean ray had ray valley on the ray volume and ray nixon and stuff like that the names when we decided to have the actual names and stick to them there was a a house that Biafra and I lived in with some other people and the pointed sticks were coming down from, from Vancouver. It's a group from Vancouver. And we said, well, we have to, you know, remember, we have to make up some good names and keep them the entire time. So we have to just call it. And Klaus Florida was originally, I came up with, uh, I wanted to poke sticks at Johnny Rock, this mungy teeth. So I, I, I was off, if originally it was floss chloride and then i thought oh wait a second maybe if i flip that you know my i am dyslexic and so maybe i in the back of my head i knew it was gonna be and i'm glad i flipped that because going through the next 40 years as floss or flossy <laughs> would have not been fun at all uh but klaus works well, that's awesome and now my, my my kid thinks of me as either daddy or klaus so i might my friends in the East Coast from the back in the day are about the only people and my immediate family, my brother and sister, think of me as Jeff still. But <laughs> well, Klaus, is, Klaus is what my brain thinks of me as. Well, Klaus, I want to I want to thank you for taking the time. Uh, people get the album Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables, the premix. I get the original one too. Get all their music and uh, go to their website deadkennedys.com. Also, they're on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, go to my website coopertalk.net. You can find over 930 episodes there. You can email me at cooper at coopertalk.net. Facebook Cooper Talk Radio. Twitter at Cooper Talk. And remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time.